Today is October 4th, 2021, and my guest is Paul Bloom, professor of psychology, formerly of Yale University, now at the University of Toronto. This is Paul's third appearance on the program. He was last here in September of 2018 talking about cruelty, and he's back to talk about suffering and his new book, The Sweet Spot, The Pleasures of Suffering and the Search for Meaning. Paul, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks so much for having me back. What is the role of suffering in making us happy? It seems a little bit like an oxymoron, perhaps. It does, and that's that's why I got interested in the topic. Um, I think there's two very different roles that suffering has as part of a good life. The first was what motivated me to write the book, which was I was very interested in kind of paradoxical pleasures we have. Like when we uh, you know, eat spicy foods or lie in a hot bath, or some of us go for a long run, do crossword puzzles, uh, see scary movies, just do things which involve work and effort and struggle and a bit of pain. And it's such a puzzle why, you know, if we're such hedonists, as so many people say, we do such things. So I was really interested in this. I thought I was going to write a book all about it. And then in the course of it, I started to realize that there's a lot of chosen suffering that doesn't fit in to that sort of more pleasure paradigm. And, you know, thinking about things like um, having children, taking on a difficult job, um, you know, relationships, long-term projects, going to war. We do these things too, willingly. And we know that they're going to bring suffering and they don't bring pleasure in any simple sense, but we see them as part of a full life. So this second part of the book is sort of saying suffering does another thing too, which is it's part of what we think of not as a pleasurable life, but a meaning and fulfilling life. And to the extent I could wrap the book all together with one moral, it's the claim that we're, we're pluralists. We're motivational pluralists. We don't just want one thing. We want to be happy. We want to, you know, scratch where it is, uh, a nice cool drink on a hot day. Nobody would argue against it. But we also have other other goals, and and as I'm saying this to you, I realize you you we, we whatever else we we will disagree on. I think we're pretty much in sync on this. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and Paul, you confessed before we started recording that you occasionally listen to Econ Talk, so you know only too well that I'm sympathetic to your viewpoint. But of course, we'll give you a hard time uh, within of the bounds of within the bounds of civility. Um, you um, you write early in the book that you started off very skeptical about research into happiness. Uh, I too am skeptical, but you changed your mind. So I want to give you a shot at changing minds. So take, take a crack at that. What do you think of that feel yeah, you, now? You, um, you, you, you are, are, you stayed skeptical. We both started in the same place and you stayed skeptical. <laughs> so a lot of, um, a lot of positive psychology over the last 20, 10, 20 years. And I say this, with respect to my friends in the field, and, and I've been to conferences, I've given talks and everything, a lot of it's flim flam. A lot of it is, is oversold, hokum, bunkum, whatever 1950s phrase I could think of right now. It's that, it's, um, it's quick fixes um, based on shoddily done studies um, designed to get people to get to publish best-selling books and and you know, get TED Talks and so on. But it's not grounded in science. And maybe worse than that, it has uh, um, a limited and sort of parched philosophy behind it, often a sort of simple-minded hedonism. So there, so now, now I'm, I'm even harsher than you've ever been. Um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, but, but, and now, now here's where you could talk, but there are some wonderful researchers in that area. There are some, some I think, brilliant scholars um, I think the field has improved. I think now there's a lot of work that's actually very careful to distinguish things like happiness and well-being and morality and, um, and in some way, uh, fulfillment. I think there's some very good studies, some done by a Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky, some who have followed in his footsteps, that really have told us interesting things. I'm more sympathetic than you are, I think, to some of the research that's done, including large scale polling studies. I think mm -hmm. these things tell us, they, they, do, um, they do well enough at telling us what sort of common sense, that when they give us results that diverge from common sense, we can say, huh, maybe we should take these seriously too. 
one of the problems I have, um, and of course, I've talked about this on the program, is you know something like you mentioned having children, which is uh, I think may have puzzled some listeners. I think most people assume with or without children, that it must be a somewhat pleasant experience because people have them. But as you point out, it leads to a lot of heartbreak and can be incredibly um, reducing of your well-being on any one day. Uh, and yet many people who have children are glad they have them, even if they would concede, as I just did, that not every day is a walk in the park, even when you're taking a walk in the park with one of your kids. Um, and yet when we ask people, about whether they're glad they had children, we get a lot of different results. And I'm not sure there's anything scientific about that. They're very sensitive to issues like, how is the question worded, as you pointed out, to ask about happiness, satisfaction, well-being, meaning, and so on. So I, some of it is just a carelessness in terms of building a survey. Some of it may be that we lie to ourselves. I worry about all these factors. Defend it in this particular kind of very complex example. It is a complex example. It's a very important one. It's um, it's one a lot of people are interested in, of course. Yeah. A lot of research on it. Um, a lot of good philosophy on it. Uh, my very good friend, Lori Paul, has talked to you about this. And she yeah. has a wonderful book, uh, an article, and then later a book called What You Can't Expect When You're Expecting. <laughs> where she where she says that you know that, that it's not clear and we she and I have long arguments about this where it's not clear that science or social science can actually tell you w whether or not it's a good idea to have a kid yeah and but I would say this I, I in some way I think maybe it's true for the case of children just because it's such a difficult on the edge case so if we had a simpler question like should I become addicted to heroin or um, should I wear an umbrella, take an umbrella when it's raining? Well, yeah, yeah, the data's pretty clear on that. We could ask people and so on. It's, it's kind of obvious. The first is bad, the second is good. Children are right in the middle. And so this is a case where it's in some way, I don't think it's due to an inade inadequacy of our data. It's just because it's sort of a 50-50 proposition and, um, and also because it's complicated. So I think both common sense and empirical data say that having kids particularly young kids is rough it takes away your sleep it increases marital arguments um it tires you out and so on and it's sort of rougher than not having kids at the time holding everything equal maybe this is just common sense but you know there's also data data on marital satisfaction data on day-to-day -day happiness but i think there's something else which holds true which is people find children Typically, they find them very satisfying. They think very important. Um, if you had to ask me to identify what I am, you know, at a different time of my life, I might have said a man, I might have said a professor, but I've had, my kids are now in their 20s, my two sons, and I might answer, first of all, I'm a father. Yeah. And it is so important to me. It is the most important thing in my life, and I don't have a scintilla of regret. But when I say that, I don't necessarily mean I had more hedons as a parent, more joys, more utils, more yeah. utils um, than if I than if I stayed if I stayed single. I mean something else. I mean, and there's survey data suggesting this. I mean, they gave my life meaning and purpose and value. So I'm going to segue to another observation of the book using this because I I'm, I'm surprised at the claim that when our children are smallest, those are the toughest years. I think those are fabulous years. It's not. Every, for every parent, not for every you know, child raising situation. But whether that's true or not, whether it's true for m most people or um, you know, almost all or some, I, I think the pleasure I get from my young children now is spectacular. Looking at old photos of them on the digital uh, frame that we have produces a bitter sweetness, which is part of your point of your book, right? The sorrow part. There is a, um, you know, the, I think it's, I assume it's Shakespeare, parting is such sweet sorrow. I think it's Romeo and Juliet. Um, we've parted from that part of our lives, from that part of our parenting experience. And um, it just, it fills me with a great deal of satisfaction and meaning to think about what they've become. And it's much more complicated what they've become than what they were then. But uh, 
What, what are your thoughts on that? I think there's a, a wise point there, um, which is one of the, the, maybe the major theme of my book is about the importance of chosen suffering. I have a very different opinion about unchosen suffering. We can talk about that. But the importance of yeah, chosen right. suffering is part of a good life, which is I think the projects that make life worth giving involve suffering. And we often know this ahead of time. And having kids is such an example. Um, for one thing, and having kids, at least for me, uh, maybe I prone, I'm prone towards anxiety, is really an experiment in feeling mild dread for the rest of my life. Loving such fragile creatures, and they, they remain fragile even into their 20s. Um, yeah. It's like, there, there's, it's like a, a, hangman's a, hang, a hangman's noose is sitting around your neck all the time. Yeah. And, um, and, and then there's, they will separate from you. If you do yeah. it right, if you do it right, if you are lucky and if you'll do it right, these creatures that you that you love and devoted your life to will leave you. And actually, if you do it right, they will think a lot less about you than you will think about them because they're going to be in their own lives. It's, yeah. such, it's such a perverse project. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a very human one. Yeah, I agree with that, obviously. Um, what you said reminds me of um, – yeah, a quote I, I heard from Elizabeth Stone, it's, it's the following. Making the decision to have a child, it is momentous. It is to decide forever to have your heart go walking around outside your body. I thought that captured that kind of anxiety you're talking about there. But I wanted to bring it, I meant to bring it back to another theme of the book, which I loved, which is that the order of the suffering and the joy is not just important, but essential. So if you ran a finished a marathon and then suffered and <laughs> spent four hours in deep pain uh it's not as satisfying as doing the pain first and then getting the thrill of finishing the marathon and i think children is not unrelated to that that a lot of the pleasures come there's a lot of investment in the beginning and especially for the, for the mother but it gets better and easier and if it was the reverse i think it would be much harder but talk about that if you want you can talk about that point with respect to childbearing but i think in in fiction and in so many things, the sequence of the suffering, climbing Mount Everest, is everything. And I don't, I've never heard that point before. I think it's a fabulous point. So it's a more general point, which applies at the specific level of day-to-day -day pleasures and also at the broader level of life. We seem to want to have get the bad stuff over with. Sometimes because we just, you know, we want to free ourselves to experience the good stuff, but sometimes because it makes the good stuff so much better. So this is a very low level explanation for why we do things like eat spicy foods or dip into hot baths, which is there's pain, but then you have the, the yogurt or the beer and it cools down your mouth. The, the water cools and it relaxes you. It's an explanation for why stories almost inevitably, uh, dramas particularly, have on the whole a bad than good arc. There's an obstacle that must be surmounted, and that's bad. That's hard. Without the hardness, it's boring. Um, and then we surmount it. But I think it's also more general. I think talking about children is, is um, another way of thinking about it, which is there's a line from, um, from Cicero, which I'm not even going to try to quote, but, um, but because I'm going to mess it up. But the idea is that, is that we, uh, we, we, we choose to have suffering and pain right now so that later on in our lives, we can look back upon it. And from a distance while it's in the past, it becomes so sweet. Um, when I wrote a, a, an article in the New Yorker um, on a similar set of topics, my editor gave me an example of a Shawshank Redemption. It's a wonderful movie, and and, uh, yeah. you know, and we have spoilers, but but the arc of the movie is this man is falsely accused of a terrible crime, spends uh, twenty years or so in a horrible prison, and then escapes, and he never gets out and dies in a terrible tragedy. It's a fabulous. No, it isn't how it ends. Strangely enough, but again, spoiler alert: you want to skip spoiler, ahead about fifteen alert, seconds skip, here. Skip yeah. aside, skip ahead fifteen seconds. He ends up living the rest of his life with his good friend on a lovely Mexican beach, yeah. and the editor pointed out. What kind of movie would it be if it was flipped? He was enjoying his paradise life on a beach and spent the rest of it in, in, in a squalid prison. That would be no story at all. So yeah, there, there's, we're temporal creatures and our suffering and our pleasure and our pain, we like them best in a certain order. When the Red Sox won the um, 
World Series in 2004 after a slight gap between the previous one, um, which I think was in 1918. Um, I felt bad for some Cubs fans Mm -hmm. who had not won a World Series, I think, since 1945, or maybe not even been in one. I'm not even sure. Apologize to Cubs fans for not knowing that off the top of my head. But one of the things I would tell them when they would get angry at me and resentful that, you know, we'd finally broken our curse, I said, yours is going to be all the sweeter for the suffering that you're going through now. And, of course, it's true, unless you die before you get to see it, in which case it's a terrible way things turn out. But assuming you live to see it, it there is something – the delayed gratification makes the gratification that much, that much more uh, pleasurable. There's an amazing uh, study by George Lowenstein, which is this. It's, um, he asked people about pleasurable things. And one thing he asked him is, imagine you could, you could kiss your favorite movie star. And I love this. Yeah, it's this fabulous part of the book. Go ahead. And <laughs> favorite movie star. And whenever you want, consensual, there's a kiss and it's very nice. And, and then he asked people, when do you want to do it? And, well, Psychology 101 says, well, you want to do it now. Because, you know, you, you, you want to satisfy your urge and delayed gratification is difficult. And you could correct me, but Economics 101 says you want to do it now. Yeah. People say, I want to wait two days. And, you know, <laughs> and like, I think two days, like, you know, come on, you, you need to get a breath mint and kind of, you know, comb your hair. But really? Because they want to savor the anticipation. Yeah. And that's just fascinating. Yeah. And I, th- and I think very, very true. Uh but I want to challenge their claim about that arc, uh, at least a piece of it. I, I, I think I'm right. I might be wrong. But, but I think that ancient art is overwhelmingly bleak. La Boheme, Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet, it doesn't end well. It doesn't end with the triumphant overcoming of obstacles. It's just one last obstacle, and it's often death. And yet in modern art, and occasionally you will get a modern piece of modern art that, in fact, it, the, more, the more bleak the ending, the more modern and avant-garde it is. But popular art doesn't work that way. Popular art is – there's always the happy ending. You know, Scrooge is the perfect example. It's somewhat not modern, but perfect example of this. Again, overcomes the obstacles, realizes he's a bad person, redeems himself, and so on. Do you have any explanation for why so much ancient art, at least, is so unrelentingly bleak? Now, you could argue it's not so popular. You could argue, I don't know, life was bleak. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? I don't know. I I think surprisingly most art is bleak. If you just add it up, most art has a lot of suffering and pain and struggles. It would be very interesting if it turns out that we have more happy endings now than we used to. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, even Rocky lost at the last fight. Um, you ruined Shawshank Redemption. Now you're ruining <laughs> the greatest boxing. Oh, come on, Paul. <laughs> the thing, the thing about the sixth sense, I have to add, no, I'm going to, I'm going to stop. This is not the, <laughs> you should just uh, beep out all the things, but a lot of, a lot of, a lot of wonderful movies and, and not so wonderful movies like, like horrible torture porn and, and very violent movies. And on a dark note, and I, I, I'm not actually sure that this that these bleak endings exist for um, exist because this is what people want, as opposed to they're sort of a cheap way to make your your film look artistic. Now I think it yeah. makes it look sophisticated. Oh, you're not doing yeah. one of these ones like it's a one pad life, or this, you know, pad yeah. endings. Look, yeah. you know, the person's going to die at the end. Take that, um, but. But what this raises is I think there's a lot of reasons why we like dark, unpleasant, sad art. And only one of them is the arc. Only one reason is that, um, that we want to have suffering because of the great payoff and end. So in, this paradigm works great right for revenge films where there's horrible things being right. done to somebody, to John Wick or whatever. And at the end, there's payback. And the payback is yeah. oh so satisfying. But you couldn't get the payback if you hadn't had to sit through the rough stuff. At the beginning, yeah, that's a paradigm. Yeah, but but um, and it's but there's so many other attractions to bleak art. One simple one is that it captures our attention. We have what what psychologists call a negativity bias, which is sometimes the ugly and the shocking and the painful, draws in. 
But I think another reason, which is something I explore in my book, and it's not original to me, is that we like to seek out negative futures, to, to, to bring our imagination to dark places. And some people see this as, as a form of play. So people think of play as a cooperative, friendly, cheerful thing, but a lot of play is play fighting and, and a play aggression. And one way to see this, and not just humans do this, like dogs do this too, is it's a way of practicing in a safe way difficult skills for bad times. And it could be that a lot of the negative fictions we see, I'm, you know, I find myself drawn to, to movies that show things that I would not want to happen to me, the breakup of a relationship, the death of a child, the, um, the, the, the destruction of the planet the loss of authority and the attack of some other, some invading group, but I'm drawn to it. And I think one reason why I'm drawn to it, whether I sort of know it or not at a conscious level is I'm drawn to, to, to bad stuff because bad, it's good for the mind to be drawn to bad stuff. And one, and one right. bit of support for this is it's true for daydreams too. Most daydreams and most dreams actually are negative. We're drawn to the negative. Well, I was going to ask you to put that in, context of your parenting anxiety, which I think every parent has some level of it, and some have a lot more than others. Um, and I think within a couple, the husband and wife have different levels of it, um, inevitably. But presumably, we worry about the future yeah. as a form of protection. It's good to be prepared, be prepared, imagine the worst, so you can be prepared for it. And yet it's a tormenting uh gift it is not uh, a gift that is you know it's not the it's the gift it's not the gift that keeps on giving it's the gift that keeps on taking it can take away a lot of the pleasure especially in the moment that you have with your children or in other situations we could we could we could imagine just what are your thoughts on that i think you're right i think i like all of these things it you can do it too much i i worry too much my my partner makes fun of me for this. I am the sort of person who on a whim buys a lottery ticket and then worries that I'll win the money and it will wreck my relationships. And then where will I be? And, and, I, and when you tell people these worries, they, they laugh at you. Um, sure. But in general, there's a reason why we worry, which is worry is a way of, of focusing us on, on negative possibilities and then making us prepare if I worry that I'm going to drop my baby, a very common worry, yeah. I hold my baby tighter. If I worry that one day I'm going to leave the house and I've left something on and the house will burn down, I check stuff before I leave the house. Worry is very motivating. And it's aversive. It's aversive because it's supposed to be aversive. If we liked it, we wouldn't be motivated to make it go away. In some way, worry, worry is akin in this way, I think, to grief which has an evolutionary account, which is, you know, the, the, the horrible pain of losing somebody you love makes you work hard not to get that pain, to take care of them. Now, like everything of this sort, sometimes it's going to come to you and there's not a damn thing you could do about it. We sometimes worry about things we've done already. Sometimes we feel grief for, for deaths that there was nothing we could do, do to stop. But I think the system works in general because it forces us to think about things that, however unpleasant, are good for us to think about. But of course, if you worry about heartbreak all the time, either from grief or being jilted or abandoned, you, the, the other response is to not give your heart away. So there's a, there's a flip side to this, yes. which is very dark. There's also, or dehumanizing, degrading. There's also the, um, the fact that it's hard to enjoy even the good times yeah. because you know they're going to end. Uh, so I think that's the, the – I think it's an interesting question whether you'd like to have less anxiety in your, in your mental makeup. I think I would. Um, and I see it mostly as a lack of control. If I'm holding the baby, I worry about dropping the baby for sure, and I'm more careful, and that's good. But there are too many things that happen to my kids out in the world that I can have nothing to do with that I worry about all the time. Uh, or not, it's too strong, but I've worried about it various times, and I think that's a shame. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's not unrelated to regret, right? It's not unrelated to the fear of, of, um, of being too cautious and ending up with many regrets, because that way at least you'll have avoided risk and bad things. 
No, I, I totally agree. There have been times myself where I said, wow, that's over. And I would have enjoyed a lot more if I wasn't so anxious about it. I would have actually got to, to pleasure in it. Um, <laughs> so, you know, my book is titled The Sweet Spot. And I have vowed not to try to insert the phrase The Sweet Spot into every conversation I fall into because it's going to be very tempting. Um, but, but, but I'll, such a good phrase. But, but I'll, do this, I'll do this here, which is regarding these negative thoughts, these, these worries and everything, there is a sweet spot. There's, yeah. Imagine a dial in your head. And I think a lot of people say, I'll turn that dial down. But there's a psychiatrist, uh, Ness, Nessie, an evolutionary psychiatrist, who points out that a lot of people go to psychiatrists and psychologists to turn their anxiety down. They take pills to turn their anxiety down. But then there are individuals whose anxiety is too far low down. Where do we find them? Not in psychiatrist's office. We find them in morgues. We find yeah. them in morgues and we find them in prisons. And, and so on, which is, if you're too cool, then you say, yeah, I'll drive my motorcycle in the rain. I'm not worried at all. And they never see it. They're feeling fine. But, but they, they constantly expose themselves to more risk for themselves and for others. And in its own way, it could be just, this is terrible. So it, it's, it's a curse to have too much anxiety, but it's also a curse to have too little. Yeah, that's spoken that sure you're, you're liberating your inner economist, right? There, there's trade-offs here is, is, is really what, what you're saying, and I think you're 100% right. You, you mentioned grief. We've talked about on the program before that this modern idea that grief is, is terrible. You're not happy, so get over it. Here, take some drugs, whatever you need to, to get back to life. And you, you mentioned a case in the book of someone who lost a, a spouse to, to cancer, I think it was, and how this person was depressed. And, yeah, they were depressed, and they that was – what they were feeling as part of this life experience of losing a loved one. And that's, it's part of life. It's not to be avoided, shunned, uh, you know, tricked through, through chemicals, maybe. I mean, people have different perspectives on it, but, but I think there's an quote, optimal amount of grief. You don't want to have it ruin your life, never live again because you've lost a loved one, but you also don't want to pretend it was no big deal. So some kind of, if I may, sweet spot. And, and, you know, you could talk about it, as I have in an economist's terms, which is what's the right amount of grief or anxiety to make it through your life? You could also talk about it in moral terms, which I think you're, you're alluding to. Um, and the person who, whose spouse died of cancer thought of it that way. It wasn't just that, well, the decline in efficiency for me suffering from grief is worth it. It's rather, there's a wonderful quote from Zadie Smith, who's herself is quoting something else. And it was, in, it was a response to somebody who was grieving the death of somebody he loved. And it's a wonderful line. The line was, it hurts as much as it's worth. And it goes both ways. For me to, to lose somebody I love and not feel grief would be acknowledging to myself and to others that it didn't matter that much. Yeah. And so I think suffering is in some way just... you. Your child dies, you you should be ripped apart. Yeah. It's what it's what the relationship, what the person deserves. So I'm I'm in some way I, I said earlier that I'm very skeptical about uh, unchosen suffering, but I think there are exceptions to this. And I think some sort of suffering that you did not choose that just comes upon you, you have to acknowledge and you have to acknowledge its value and its importance. Yeah, it's part of the human experience. When you mentioned deserving, you meant the person who died, yes, not, right. not the, that's right. the the one who was left behind. Um, talk for a minute about children's literature and horror films. Uh, I am not into horror films. I don't like them. Um, children's literature is very dark. Uh, it usually involves the death of parents. Um, I, I, there's an extraordinary number of, of great children's books that involve an orphan. Um why do you think that is? Doesn't that seem like a? I mean, we become very protective of our children in modern times, so we don't want to don't want to expose them to traumatic things. In the old days, they didn't feel that way. It's so like let's traumatize them, <laughs> let's get them used to life, let's get them start them early. That's right. What do you think about that, those issues? Children's books are are, are fascinating. Uh, you know, my day job is as a developmental psychologist, and very interested in minds of children, and I think certainly children are in many many ways more vulnerable than adults. I think they're less capable, I know they're less capable of shielding the fictional from the real. You could see this most horrible thing and it could shock you, but you just know it's a movie and it might bother your dreams or occupy your thoughts, but you could just say, this isn't real. A young enough child has some problem segmenting all of this. 
But children are dark creatures and they, like the rest of us, are fascinated by, by terrible things. They're fascinated by cruelty. Um, no one's ever done the experiment, but I have no reason to doubt that a, child, a children's book with a very unhappy ending could still become a very popular children's book. Um, now, The Orphans is actually something which fascinates me. is a little bit different. So this is sort of a double whammy. There's this sort of morbid fascination of a kid for losing his parents, which is the worst thing you can imagine as a kid, perhaps. But also, these stories always have a sort of wish fulfillment, which is, you know, I'm a kid, I'm a normal schmo growing up in a suburb of Laval, and I guess my mom and dad are fine, whatever. But to actually be a prince, maybe I'm actually a prince. Maybe I'm actually the person who's going to save the world. Maybe I'm actually, my, my billionaire family's going to whisk me away. So how can I have a story of indulging that fantasy? Well, goodbye, mom. Goodbye, Dad. That's a really, real sad news. But now, now I get to have my fantasy. That's a fantastic observation. I, and, and, and it comes back to the point about overcoming things, right? You've got the plucky. It's always a plucky hero after the death of the parents yes. who, you know, is stuck in the um, – in the orphanage, stuck in the hands of the cruel guardian or whatever, and has to, you know, rise above it to to become the hero that they want to see them. So I never thought about that, that that's it's a little bit it's a little bit depressing. But I think you're probably I think you're right. Uh I mean who who they, what what child wouldn't want to be Harry Potter? Right. Right. Yeah, yeah so so true. Um let's talk about Robert Nozick. And Alan Watts, who both posed some interesting uh, thought experiments. The Nozick one we've talked about before, but uh, let's talk about it again. Uh, and then the Alan Watts one's very interesting. Start with Nozick and and why you think that's of, of interest to your exploration. So Nozick proposed um, a classic experiment, an, a thought experiment called the experience machine. And it's not incredibly far away from what we could imagine neuroscientists doing. Um, it's, it's, and it's a common enough theme, but, it, but here it goes. Very simple. You can decide to put yourself in an experience machine. This will sort of stimulate your brain in a certain way. And for the rest of your natural life that your body will last, you will experience a life of wonder, of, of satisfaction, of victory, of great love, great triumph, the best life you could really imagine. Um, and but you will not be doing a thing, of course. You'll be lying inert on the table. And um, your experiences, you won't actually be having experiences or you think you'd be having it. Now, Nozick says people wouldn't want to be put into this machine. And because this is, and he viewed this as a refutation of a simple hedonism. If all I want is pleasure, that I would jump into the machine, push everybody as I get me into that machine. Uh, and remember, once you're in a machine, you no longer remember that you signed up for the machine. So you, you believe your life. If you, you know, if your life is really good right, right now, maybe you're an experience machine, but <laughs> Nozick says, we do not want such a thing. We don't want to think we climb Mount Everest. We want to climb Mount Everest. We don't want to think people love us. We want people to love us. The experiences only get value because they reflect realities. And so that's the machine. Now, if you ask people, would you go into the experience machine, it actually gets a little bit messy. I think Nozick often wrote uh, from his stance in life that, oh, nobody would want to do that. But many people say, yeah, that sounds really good. And uh, He's no longer with us. And in 2021, it seems less of a – his claim seems a little bolder than it did when he yes. wrote it. And, and keep in mind, um, a lot of people blot themselves out with, with drugs like heroin. And that's an experience machine too, just not as, not as efficient yeah. or, or, or clean. Um, and so I like, I like the thought experiment. I think it's very telling. I think the fact that many people, including me, and I, I would bet including you, would not take yep. that machine, suggests right. we don't just want pleasure. We want accomplishment. We want satisfaction. We want to do good in the world. But the fact that many people would go into the machine forces me to sort of respect, well, the moral pluralism part, where, where we have many motivations. And some people would rank pleasure and satisfaction 
more than other things. And then, of course, there's also the context. So, so I'm living a life which I'm very satisfied with. If I was in, in a maximum security prison for the rest of my life, I would give everything I have. So if your life is misery, you know, the machine is very tempting. I want to add two things to the Nozick from your book for you to talk about. One is I want you to talk about Alan Watts first. So Alan Watts has another thought experiment, which I thought I'd never heard. It's quite, quite provocative. So when, when you're writing a book like this, you kind of have your eyes out for everything. And I was with my partner watching, uh, waiting to watch the last Avengers movie, Avengers Endgame, I'm doing a large cinema. And they had these commercials before. And they have a commercial, I don't know, they have like couples walking down the beach. And then there's a voice. And the voice says, you know, imagine you could dream. And I'm thinking, and I'm listening and say, what in the world is this? Because it's kind of beautiful. And, and I, I, I listened to the whole thing, like a transfixed. And it turns out to be a, a, a commercial, I don't know, for Scotiabank or something, like this sort of thing, or a hedge fund or something like that. But I go home, I remembered enough keywords to go home, and, I, and it turns out this is something from Alan Watts, the, the great uh, sort of wonder person, people who brought Buddhism to the, to the West. And, um, and the story goes like this. He says, imagine you could have a dream, and he didn't use the word, but a lucid dream, where you find you could do, have a, live whatever life you want. And he said, and then he basically said that, that well, you would choose pleasures, all sorts of sensory and sensual pleasures, and have this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time. And live 80 years like that in your night. You wake up the next day, and then you wake, and then you, another, another night you fall asleep, and you have the same opportunity. And what he said is sooner or later you get bored. And what you would do is you would throw obstacles in front of yourself. You would have your dream that, that you would try something, but you might fail. You might be disappointed. You might be hurt. You might work at something to no end. But ultimately, you would choose a life of difficulty and struggle. And then the punchline is, and the end, he says, and maybe perhaps that is the life you are now living. And it struck me as, as very wise. It struck me as that... Even on a hedonist own term, own term, say, I want to have the best time I can have, you would quickly get bored with simple pleasures and you would want a life of difficulty and struggle and pain. That could be your best life. Now, an economist would answer that, I think, rather facilely, but, but we would answer it easily. We would say, well, well, sure, you'd take some suffering and pain, some obstacles, but that's, that's so you could enjoy, that, that, that's so you get even more utils, more utility, more pleasure when the later thing comes. So it's all about pleasure. Do you agree? I know you don't. Oh God, you know. Um, and I, I don't either anymore. I used to, but I don't anymore. So of course, you know, writing this book, I think these issues, you encounter hedonists and, um, and people who want to defend, uh, we were always after the utils business. I, I'll, I'll, um, I'll name him because he's been such a good help for him to write, write the book. Dan Gilbert is a social psychology professor at Harvard. And he thinks I'm totally wrong about everything in my book. And that's my third example I was going to ask you to add into the Nozick is his story. So you can get there eventually or you can whatever. Go ahead. So, so Dan, Dan basically says, you know, this is just an illusion. Whenever we say we're doing something for meaning or for, for morality or for purpose, all we basically mean is it gives us more pleasure to, uh, to, to do it than um, – than not to do it. And, you know, so if, if I leave my scrumptious dinner to help this old lady across the street, and I say, look, it's not just pleasure, I'm trying to do good, Dan would laugh at me and say, and say, no, you just like helping a person across the street more than you like your dinner. So put that in that broad way. One problem with this is it's, it's so vague as to, as to be uh, uh, in some way uninteresting. Whenever somebody has a sort of argument where they could use no matter what you say, you wonder, are you saying, you know, is are you saying anything interesting? And even Dan, I think, would agree we have multiple motivations. Um, morality, meaning, pleasure. He just thinks they all sort of have a common currency. And he's not entirely wrong. If you choose to do a favor for a friend, rather than to have an enjoyable swim in your swimming pool. That means that somewhere in your head, you put value upon those two options and a favor to the friend outweighed the pool. And so there has to be a common currency. I don't think I would call it pleasure, 
but it does suggest that pleasure and morality and purpose, the relationships between them, they can't be as distinct as somebody like me would say. There has to be something that they have in common. Yeah, Jerry, ben Jer Jerry Bentham, I was going to call him Jerry Bentham. It was, a mis it was a misquote, but Jeremy is actually his name. I, don't I doubt anybody called him Jerry. He's kind of a serious, I wouldn't think he's a Jerry kind of guy. guy or Jer. Well, yeah. Jeremy Bentham would agree with that. He spent his life trying to find that common currency, he tried money for a while. Economists adopted that common currency, not in the sense that people want money, but the idea that you could put a dollar value on different pleasures and thereby weigh them accordingly. Or you could ask what people would be willing to pay for something, even though it wasn't a monetary pleasure or a physical, a, um, related to work or commerce. You could ask them what they'd be willing to pay to go help the old lady, what they'd be willing, and what they pay in helping the old lady is they gave up the dinner, the opportunity cost, which you write about in the book. And therefore, we know that they value the helping the old lady more than the dinner. Uh, I think that's wrong. Uh, it's not a... a you know, listeners have heard me talk about this before. I'm going to leave it alone for now. I just think it's it's wrong. It's also depressing. It's it's a bleak view of of human nature as as automaton, as as utility maximizer, as this machine to rack up the utils. It's not how we behave. It's not how we think. And in fact, you know, if you're having that dinner with a um, uh, a beautiful person that you you're romantically interested in and you give up that opportunity to go help the person across the street or it's an incredibly important job interview, I think it's a little more complicated than saying, well, it was worth it. I, I think there's angst. There's worries about the right thing. There's a lot more going on than just, well, I put it on the scale and I picked the one that was the highest. And I, I just, I've become a skeptic of my own profession in that, in that area. But talk about, you can react to that, but I also want you to talk about Dan Gilbert's thought experiment, which I found Repugnant, to be honest, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Dan, and, and um, this is a, this is actually from email correspondence as I've had with him. Plus, something he's an unpublished manuscript he had. And he was very generous, both to comment on my book and let me include. Uh, he's a fine uh, human being, even if he's totally wrong. It's okay. And Dan, I'm just teasing. And if you want to come on the program, I'd love to talk to you about happiness. Go ahead. Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> Dan, Dan would be a wonderful guy to for you to talk with. If you would have so much to disagree about. Um, <laughs> He says, look, you know, there's, there's psychologists like Dan Kahneman um, talk about uh, two kinds of judgments we make. And one is day-to-day -day pleasure. Um, and uh, imagine you're, a, you're in a swimming pool and it's the nicest pool in the world and it's a, a cool, cool pool, hot day, your belly's full, you know, you have friends waiting for you, you're having a good time, so nice and everything like that. And you spend 90% of the, of the day like that 95%. But 5% of the day, you leave your pool, you dry yourself off, you're sitting before you fall asleep and think, my life is a failure. This is a terrible way to live a life. And one traditional answer, which is Kahneman's, which is many, maybe it was just mine actually, say, well, change your life. You're messing it up. But Dan's response is, that's so unfair. You, you're taking two individuals. One of them call it the pig which just likes pleasure. One of them calls Socrates, which likes wisdom and value and everything like that. And you're letting Socrates have say, but you're dismissing the pig for no fair reason. It is just unfair to let the sort of rational, deliberative, complaining part of your life hold sway over the majority part of life. And there's kind of a trick, which is whenever you think about it, Gilbert points out, Socrates pops into mind. Like I say, I wonder if I'm happy. And now I'm sort of contemplative philosopher Paul. And I say, no, I'm not. I'm not maxing out on these goals I want to and everything. But most of the time when I, I am happy, but it's only, it, it's like the illusion when you open up the refrigerator, the refrigerator is always on because whenever you open it up, it lights up. What, what the subjective feeling of, uh, that when we ask ourselves if we're happy, we then trigger a self that is very different from our everyday self. And to rely on that is simply unfair. And it's simply we're spoiling ourselves out of our own life. Now, to make the point, Gilbert makes an argument, which, which for me backfires, which he says, forget about yourself. Imagine your son 
one of your sons, I mean, you, you, I think of one of my sons, uh, was living that life, 95% pure pleasure, but and 5% doubt, and is he living a good life? And so on. would I want him to do that, or would I want him to flip it, where he has 5% happy and 95% um, Five percent, sort of thinking, I'm living the right life, and ninety-five percent in physical misery. The answer is, I would not want to flip it, but I also actually don't want to have a son who is, a, in a philosophical sense, a pig. <laughs> if, if if I had, if one of my sons was saying, I am so happy, ninety-five percent of the time, I lie on a sofa and I watch Netflix and I smoke a joint, and I am as happy as can be. I would say, get off of, the, get get a, get a job. And I because and then my complaint here is is I think moral, which is yeah. that's a oh. bad way to live a life. You're not helping other people. You're not making a difference. You're not engaged in a long term project. You are, you know, when I think it was John Stuart Mill who called the hedonic self the pig. You were being a non human animal because you're not aspiring to any good things. I'm not sure how convincing that is to somebody who doesn't already believe some of these premises, but I think. A lot of the argument about the life we should live isn't going to be settled through psychological research and survey studies. It's going to be in some way developed or settled through moral arguments. Well, I think it matters. I, and I, I'm thinking about Laurie Paul yeah. and the vampire problem, uh, the idea that before you're a vampire, it looks disgusting. But when you're a vampire, it's great. And you look back on the poor mortals who were out in the daytime and real, they don't realize how bad their life is. So the pig looks at Socrates and says, boy, is he missing out on the fun? Socrates looks at the pig and says, the unexamined life is not worth living. Um, and I, I don't think anyone wants their offspring to be wastrels. Yeah. <laughs> they don't want their kids to be, quote, unhappy. But meaning matters, I think, yep. for most of us. Now, if, if you know, there, there's a, we've talked about this movie before, and this is, I can, uh, I think it's okay to do a spoiler alert on this one because, I mean, to spoil it because it's such a, it's not a, in the same class as some of the others. But the movie Sabrina is, uh, in the original version, William Holden is the playboy, um, have good time, no responsibilities, and he has a blast. He's happy as, as a clam or a pig. And Humphrey Bargart, he puts his shoulder to the grindstone, his whatever is to the grindstone, his nose to the grindstone, I guess. And he keeps this business going that that he thinks is important and seems rather focused on the achievements of the business rather than the money. He doesn't enjoy much of the money, doesn't have much of the pig in him. Now, one way to look at it is to say, well, they're just two different people. They have different things float their boat. And we should just be agnostic about it. They're both fine. It's just whatever you feel like. I don't know. I don't, I don't, find, that, I don't find that very appealing. And... Um, much of Western culture, you could argue, and at least through most of its history, was to try to remind people that there's more to life than being a pig. I don't know. And and there's some weak empirical support for this way of talking where you I'll, – I'll, I'll lay out the experiment. You tell me what you think of it. But you ask people how happy you are and how much meaning you have in your life. And these correlate. It's really good news. You could be high in one and high in both. But they also yeah. separate. So there's, there's a population of people who say, I'm very, very happy, but my life has no meaning, and then the converse. And it turns out there are different kinds of people. And happy people have maybe, as you'd expect, pretty low anxiety, low anxiety, low worry, low conflict. People with meaningful lives um, have a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry, and a lot of conflict. But the key difference here is that happy people focus more on themselves. They don't try to make the world a better place. While people who say their lives have meaning, it's often outer directed. You look at the jobs that are most meaningful, that people say they get the most meaning from, it's jobs like being in a clergy, being a social worker, being a physician. They're not- Teacher. Teacher, yes, teacher. Um, and it cuts across different kinds of teachers. A post, post-secondary teacher actually is, is, is pretty high. Um, and and I, these jobs are not necessarily high status. They don't necessarily pay well, and they're hard. But they leave the people doing them with the feeling that they're making a difference. And I think we could step back and say, well, that's a good way to live your life. You should want to make a positive difference to other people. The world is better off with people leading lives of meaning and lives of happiness if they had to choose one another. 
but you shouldn't be a sucker and give up the chance to sit in that pool all day working for other people. Come on, get in the pool, right? I mean, it's a real, it's a problem, right? And I think, again, I think most of, of certainly religion to a large extent and until recently culture was trying to push people in the direction of getting out of the pool now and then yes. um, to make those sacrifices. And of course, you could argue part of what religion does and part of what culture does is try to make you feel good about making those sacrifices so they do become self-interested, a point that Dan Klein made on this program and his conversation about Adam Smith. And I think it's a deep, deep insight. It's It may be the case that now many of us do things that we think are out, so-called altruistic, out of self-interested, feel-good, self-satisfaction, and so on. But it wasn't always this way, and I don't think it comes so naturally to us. I, you know, the religion point is a good one. A lot of what religion wants you to do for different reasons is get you out of the pool. And yeah. sometimes they try to get you out of the pool by saying, look, you know, yeah, you're going you're gonna to give up on a little bit of pleasure now, but man, the pleasure you're going to get at the, at the, at the, at the, at the end of it is going to be um, amazing. Religion also, I think, at its best, religion reminds you that there's other virtues than, than happiness and tries to nurture virtues within you. Yeah. I want to ask you another question about morality and, and culture. I think you know a lot of your book is talking about the evolutionary value of various things that we, we're interested in. Sometimes it's suffering. Sometimes it's pleasure. Obviously, you're, that's not an easy circle to square or square to circle, but you, you do it pretty well. But, but you don't give much credence to culture. I want to, I want to go back to this example about uh, horror movies. Uh, there's a miniseries uh, on TV I watched for a while called Daredevil. It was a Marvel character I loved as a as a boy, and it was fun to see Daredevil brought to life. And it's a very clever, clever um, script. It's the dialogue's fantastic. It's it's just really well done. The violence was so uh, creepy in it for me after a while that I just stopped watching because I found myself, you know. After watching it, like, in a bad mood, yeah. and I'm trying to think, why do I – oh, yeah, I just watched that show. Uh, another example would be The Americans, which I watched from start to I, – so I stopped watching Dear Devil. But The Americans is a pretty gruesome uh, miniseries, and it's so spectacularly great in terms of dialogue and character and moral dilemmas. And I, I loved that show. But I wondered if it was somewhat degrading. There's, there's a lot of really bad death in that show. And it also, I think – I worried that it was not, quote, good for me. That's a very 19th century uh, attitude of mine. Uh, I think most people would say, like, oh, it's fun. It's a good for or, as you write about in the book. We need it. We like it. We crave it. We like watching violence. You want to talk about that? I, I found I find that interesting. I think we we do like to be scared. But isn't it your possibility it's not so healthy? Or do you want to be agnostic on that? Not not agnostic, but conflicted. Um, this is uh, far less interesting than than the question you raise. But you probably know there's long been a debate over whether video games and violent movies make kids more violent, and the results sure. seem to be a wash. There's some short term effects, yeah. but it doesn't seem to to have yeah. have a big effect. But that's not really what you're talking about. You're not talking about whether when you see the Americans, you're more likely to dismember a no. body and put it in four suitcases. You saw that scene. It's 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 more like sure. it just it just may be bad for you. Um, and yeah, I can't deny that that's true. If if we're gonna argue, and I would argue that some of these things can be good for you, that that some TV shows that I watch and love. I think make me better by putting me in a mindset and morality, which is different from my own in a, in a superior, in a superior way. Um, then you got to say that there are moral risks watching the Americans or the Sopranos or secession, all shows that I love, but all shows that have not only to have odious characters, but they put you in a moral view where Bad behavior is good behavior. 
It's um here here's a very mundane school marmish yeah. example, which is um there's a lot of sitcoms I used to watch when I was was a kid where there'd always be a smart aleck kid who would like insult his parents and I would constantly and then the laugh track would roar and it would be treated with affection. So you're watching this as a kid and you think, well, this is plainly the right thing to do. You should make fun of your parents because your dad is fat and your mom's slow and everything. And it's funny and they like it. And it, it gives you a moral view. So it's not really that the, that the effect of The Sopranos is that you're going to leave thinking you could, you know, you could whack your academic enemies, you know. But you watch The Sopranos and it carries a certain attitude for how you should treat your friends and how you should treat women and, and how to carry yourself as a person. And it's impossible not to, not to absorb that. Um, and it could have different, I just watched, I just watched with my partner, a very short uh, lived TV series called clickbait and clickbait revolves around uh, uh, murder and accusations of infidelity. And in clickbait, um, infidelity is seen as the worst thing in the world. It, it destroys families. It leads to death. It is, it is, and they show the pain of it and everything like that. And that's a moral view. I have seen other shows where infidelity is seen as a laugh. It is seen as yeah, just, sure. Of and, course. And, you know, no big deal. Our, our main character does it, but he's a great guy and so on. Shows carry moral views. The moral views we're exposed to shape how we see the world. It can't help but have an effect, either good or bad. Well, you write at one point about antiheroes, and I've often thought about how – what a modern phenomenon the antihero is. The person, you know, whether it's the cad, to use a very old-fashioned word, uh, the rogue, to use another. These used to be villains. Now they're kind of heroes, right? We kind of um, – we call them antiheroes, but they're heroes with different moral values than the heroes of the past. And I don't know why – you know, I'm living in Israel now, and – Israel's a very different place culturally. Uh, you may have seen the show um, Shtisel, which is the story of an ultra-Orthodox Jewish family in a neighborhood of Jerusalem called Meisharim. And it's got worldwide interest. It's not just watched by Jews. I'm not sure ultra-Orthodox Jews like it at all. Um, but a lot of people are interested in it who aren't Jewish, who aren't religious. And one of the charms of the show is that everybody in the show – has the same problems everybody has who isn't religious. You know, they're worried about whether their kids are going to get married. They're worried about making money and get, putting food on the table. They're human beings. And it's, so there's a charm to the show like that. But I think the other charm of the show is that the people in the show, for all their, and they have many flaws, but they don't have the flaw of irony. Huh. They're very innocent. They're almost naive. And it's such a breath of, of fresh air, I think, for a modern viewer to have heroes who are innocent and naive. They're not pure, they're not good. Many of them are, they're flawed, they do bad things, they do selfish things, they make mistakes, but they are different from the sort of person we've come to to find charming in, in say, The Americans or Breaking Bad or The Sopranos. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like that at all. And I just wonder whether First of all, I'm fascinated by why antiheroes have become the cultural norm, and I wonder whether it matters. Uh, you're suggesting it does matter. It, it affects us in some way. What are, what are your thoughts on that? I'm suggesting it, it does. I mean, just taking it further, I think, I think there's some wisdom that you become like the people you hang out with. And, mm. and I spend a lot of my time hanging out with, uh, you know, people on TV and, and in the yeah, movies. That's interesting. The anti-heroes thing is very interesting. Um, in some way, you could simply see it as a mark of sophistication. So, so comic books have, you know, simple comic books have good guys and bad guys that describe themselves as good guys and bad guys. You know, there's a brotherhood of evil mutants. They're evil, so they name themselves as evil, and they just want to do evil. And that's a terribly simplified view of, of morality. Um, and so the sort of creation of the anti-hero is in some way a mark that we're of, of, of better, better TV, better literature, which is to recognize that somebody could, could be roughly good, but also have bad parts in them. Um, and that somebody who's evil could have families they love and are, don't think of themselves as evil and so on. Yeah. So in some way, um, I think it's good. But I think it gets taken to an extreme 
And um, oh, I'm so glad we're discussing television because it's my favorite thing. Um, uh, Tony Soprano is a wonderful example. So Emily Nussbaum coined the term bad fans. And the bad fans of Tony Soprano, who was, was a mobster, violent mobster, were the people who didn't see him as an interesting, complex character who does bad things, but rooted for him, decided yeah. he was not and the anti-hero, though he was, for, the, for them, he was pure hero. And they would root for him. And it was exactly the same problem with Walter White in Breaking Bad. There were certain scenes where Walter White would interact with, his, uh, with his, the, the woman playing his wife, and Skyler, and she would basically say, you should stop killing so many people. And he would say, you're such a drag. I'm Walter White. I want to kill a lot of people. And then the actress who played Skyler White would get hate mail from people furious at her for wanting to stop their hero character for doing what they want. And I think what people have done there is they bought into a skewed moral vision. And I think also the part, part of the thing, and this, I never thought I'd mentioned this twice in one conversation, but we talked about Harry Potter. This is a different sort of witch fulfillment, which is I am, you know, I think a reasonably civilized, nice person. And I say, please and thank you. And I answer my emails promptly and everyone, and what a kick would it be to be somebody who inspired fear, who, who, who had the power of life and death over people, who was a real menace. Yeah. You know, Walter White, Tony Soprano, Hannibal Lecter even. Yeah. And so I think there's a fantasy in that too. I think that's a deep insight. I think it's also a deep insight, although I don't know if it's as true, is, which is that Certainly, we're we tend to be like the people we hang around with, and I, you know, a lot of your book we haven't gotten to this part yet, but and we probably won't given the time. But you write a lot about imagination. We talked a little bit about it earlier, and you know, living vicariously through, you know, Walter Mitty, James Thurber's story was an early yeah. example of this. But imagining yourself as Tony Soprano has got to be part of the appeal of these shows. Um, we all, you know, I like to say that the veneer of civilization is thin that, you know, underneath most of us scratch a little of the surface. There's a very dark side of us that wants revenge, that wants to, to crusade, not just for good things, but sometimes for just the point of crusading. And um, these shows tap into that in a way I had never thought about. But this idea that that by hanging around with them, and we hang around with them quite a bit. It's one a thing to watch a two-hour program I spent I guess it's, I think it's the Americans, I want to say is, it's, I want to say it's seven seasons. I can't remember, but it's, it's a, it's dozens of hours. And forget the fact that I'm a religious Jew. I hang out with Stiesel, I think, in his family is probably a little better for me. Um, the other thing I love about that show, by the way, is it does not romanticize religion. There's almost no religion in the show. There's no glorification of the uh, religious observance of the characters or romanticization of what, say, Shabbat is like for them. And I think or the, the Sabbath, and I think that's part of the other reason it's a charming show. But, but the idea that, that even though it's fake and it's fiction, by immersing in those worlds as we do when we binge watch especially, it somehow – Colors us is that is that plausible? You want to defend that? It's I don't know if it's true. It is. Plausible. I'm worried about it. It is plausible. I think in a subtle way. I don't think it's gonna. Again, I don't think you're gonna be able to see how often people watch a show and whether they're willing to commit a crime or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But, but there are there are subtle totally. ways. I I often find that when I'm watching a show, it affects my speech patterns. It affects mm -hmm. how 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 I talk. It affects what I find funny. Um, the characters live with me for a while. And again, again, this could be, this could be for the best. Um, I think that, that um, TV and movies are very, very moral, regardless of their intentions, they present moral views where some things are right and some things are wrong. Every, every TV program, every detective show, for instance, which shows the good detective beating up somebody to get a clue to save somebody's life is transforming the moral message that this is, this is okay. Yeah. Because, and, and every, every detective show, which has the main character being rude to a woman or, or not paying child support says this is okay. And 
you know, artists should be able to do what they want. Maybe they think it's okay. Maybe, um, maybe, and conversely, every movie or TV show which has the evil character, the rapist, smoke a cigarette. It's saying, smoke, cigarette smoking is bad. <laughs> you know, yeah. one day, one day we're going to have this evil character who is a serial killer and he's not going to refuse to use people's preferred pronouns. And that will tell us a message, you know, and, and this happens all the time. And I think it's foolish to say that we're immune to these messages. Hmm. It's an interesting question, right? It works on us in ways we certainly are not always aware of. I'm sure a lot of people have more Yiddish in their vocabulary now because of Stiesel and they use it unthinkingly. Um, Let's close with what it was like to write this book. Uh, it, it's a very wide-ranging book on many different aspects of the human experience, the role of suffering, what's really important about happiness. Is it me, how important is meaning? How meaningful is meaning? Did it change your day-to-day -day activities in any way that, you've, that you're conscious of? You know, it, it's just, it could be just it's just your latest book project, but it's you spent – kind of like the binge watching you spent a lot of time reading and thinking about these issues has it affected how you choose to live your life in any way you added some more suffering taken some away watch more horror movies i think it helped me add some more of the the right sort of suffering to my life so one of the one of the catalysts of the book though i didn't know it at the time was i read this book uh flow by uh, Csikszentmihalyi a long time ago. And it had this radical thesis, which is that people are better off when they're engaged in sort of serious, intense work than when they're on vacation. They're actually more satisfied, you know, being focused on something. And to me, this was an epiphany. This is, you know, I say, because I always thought I was an oddball. I'd always like go on trips and leave, leave all my work behind because I'm here to have fun. And then not have so much fun because weirdly reading and thinking, was my fun in a sort of odd way. Um, yeah. So um, it reminded, and I had forgotten this to some extent, and writing the book reminded me. I've started to, uh, to go to a, a, a gym where it's a, a 50 minute, rather painful experience of throwing around weights and going there every second day and, um, and trying to in fact cultivate aversive activities that I think will satisfy me at a deeper level. So this book is, is, you know, however this might pain my publicist to hear this, not a self-help book. It's, it's just an exploration. But, but I, I, got some, I got something out of writing it. So my guest today has been Paul Bloom. His book is The Sweet Spot. Paul, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you so much for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty, for more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.